I'd like to thank you everyone who joined us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Fast Packet Processing with Cube Virtue. I'm Paul Simon, CNCF Ambassador and Solution Engineer at Oracle. I will moderate today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenters today, Peter, Peter, Peter Horacek, Senior Software Engineer at Red Hat, and the David Wassell, Principal Software Engineer at Red Hat, a great team from Red Hat today. Nice. A few housekeeping items before we get a start. During the webinar, we are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a QA box on, at the bottom of your, of your screen. Please feel free to drop your question there and we will get to as many as we can at the end. We should remind, remind uh, this is an official webinar of CNCF as a sub, is a subject of CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to that to the chat or question that will be in violation of the Code of Conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at CNCFAO slash webinars. With that, I'll hand it over to Petra and Dave and kick off today's presentation. Hey, thanks. All right, so I'll kind of do an intro here. Um, my name is David Vossel, and I'm joined here with Peter Horchek. And together, uh, we're going to talk a bit about KubeVirt and how to achieve fast packet processing with KubeVirt. And just for my own sanity, uh, since this is a webinar, can, does everything look all right? Do we have the slides up? Does my audio sound good? Are we we're good to go? All right, good. Um, so I'm going to kick things off talking a little bit about uh, what Qvert is, how we can combine Qvert with other components to form what we're calling an opinionated install, and ultimately show how uh, opinionated installs can be used to, to kind of shape Qvert's performance characteristics. Um, so the big point that I'm going to be trying to drive home here is we don't get performance for free. This is something that we have to tune, and we're going to be talking about how that's done. Uh, so the goal here with this intro is to provide you all with some context around how um, Qvert works and how we can couple, couple it with our components and how it's tuned. And then uh, all this is to tee it up uh, for this conversation that Petra is going to go into about the details around how fast packet processing is achieved with Qvert. Okay, so to start things off here, let me, what is Qvert? This is my definition. Uh, it changes every once in a while, but this is the one I've been going with lately. Uh, Qvert, it's a Kubernetes uh, extension that allows us to run uh, traditional virtual machine workloads natively side by side with container workloads. And for anyone who isn't familiar with how Qvert works, I'm not gonna dive into all the details here because that's not exactly the topic of this presentation, but I wanna give you some context to go with um, and the context is Qvert is managing virtual machines as KVM QME processes inside of just standard Kubernetes pods. And the takeaway here is we're not a container runtime. Uh, we're gonna use whatever cont container runtime you're already using, whether that's Docker or Cryo or ContainerD. And since our virtual machines, they're running in these kind of just normal pods, we're leveraging all the existing cluster resources provided uh, for pods and we can extend those to virtual machines. So when you think about things like network and storage, uh, pods use CNI for network and CSI for storage and we're not inventing anything new here. Uh, we play nice with the entire pod ecosystem. Um, and I'm hoping that's all you really need to get kind of the gist of the rest of the presentation about Kubert and how it works. Uh, of course, it's, it's more complicated than this uh, with our control plane and everything, but I'm not going to get into all those details. It's just the bare minimum that I think that you guys need uh, to, to kind of move forward with this. So when we look at the scope of what Qvert does, um, you'll see that we purposely kind of limited 
just to the management of the life cycle of virtual machines. Um, think of QVirt as kind of like a, a tool set and we're being careful about not boxing ourselves into any sort of narrow or rigid workflows. Um, the idea is we want the QVirt project and the, uh, the surrounding ecosystem to be modular and we need to remain flexible and really agile to change so it evolves with us. Um, so here's an analogy uh, coming from a Kubernetes background. Um, you can run a database in a Kubernetes pod with a persistent volume claim for the persistent storage. And in Kubernetes, it's not telling you how to populate that PVC with the database's data. It's not telling you how to back up and restore that database. Instead, it's giving you a tool set you can use to perform and automate those actions. And in Kubevert, we're, we're trying to follow similar patterns. So for example, you can use Kubevert to start a virtual machine using a disk located on a persistent volume claim and a specific network provided by a CNI plugin. Um, Kubevert, it doesn't care how that disk got on the PPC and it doesn't care what network you're using. It's merely, merely a tool set for binding those cluster resources to a KVM virtual machine and it's managing the life cycle of that virtual machine as a pod. Now, <clears throat> just because we've limited the scope of the Kubert project itself, um, that definitely doesn't mean we don't care or we doesn't mean that we're not interested in enabling the kinds of common um, workflow patterns people would expect coming from existing virtual machine management platforms. So we, we completely recognize that there's a legacy here that we have to be aware of. Uh, people using virtual machine management platforms like VMware or um, Rev or OpenStack or um, maybe even I would consider the public cloud like AWS and GCP to fall in this category as well. Um, there, all that comes with a set of expectations around features that need to be present in this virtual machine management platform. And with KubeVirt, we're taking a completely modular approach to kind of meeting those expectations. So you get the KubeVirt core. And then you layer on the additional components you want to enable the kind of workflows or um, features you need. And I, I'll briefly just look at a couple of examples here to kind of drive that home so it makes it a little bit more tangible for everyone. One of the most common examples of an add-on for Kubevert is something called the containerized data importer. And with CDI, you can enable, well, CDI is short for containerized data importer. I just threw an acronym out there without even. So CDI, uh, it's something that allows you to enable workflows for importing and managing a collection of virtual machine images on persistent storage in order to build a um, kind of virtual machine image registry. So you can use CDI to import your images into PVCs from various sources like um, S3, HTTP endpoint, or um, you can even upload it from your, from your laptop if you want. And then CDI is going to provide all the workflows for cloning these images and making them available to be consumed uh, by Kubert virtual machines as persistent volume claims. So again, talking about the uh, remaining modular here, um, you don't have to have CDI to use Kubert, but if you want these image flows, uh, it's a great addition. But again, you, you aren't locked into our vision for how virtual machine images should work. You can create your own component to place images on uh, persistent volume claims or provide it some other way and uh, that's fine as well. The whole point is uh, you know we're modular and we, we're flexible there uh, but we're providing that functionality as well with the add-on. Um, so add-on functionality it can get even deeper than just virtual machine image flows. Uh, another example that kind of is more in line with this presentation is um, coupling QVert with something like Maltus, SRV uh, device and CNI plugins. And by coupling Kubert with these network components, uh, we unlock the ability to pass host SRV devices directly to uh, the pod and ultimately pass it on to that virtual machine guest. And if we want to take it even a step further, um, if you need to provide a, a virtual machine with something like a uh, physical or virtual GPU, coupling Kubert with a NVIDIA, with the NVIDIA GPU device plugin is going to provide the ability to pass GPUs on the host directly into that virtual machine pod and onto that virtual machine guest. So there's a lot of examples of this. There's, there's tons of different plugins and components and all this and different ways of configuring 
Qvert um, for whatever use case it is. But you know, again, the point I'm trying to drive home here is when you use Qvert, you decide what functionality you want, and the entire ecosystem is designed to be modular to support that. And I think it's also important to recognize uh, not, ever, not everyone cares about trying to replicate these traditional virtual machine use cases even. So we've seen new use cases emerge as well. And one example of this that um, is nested Kubernetes. And it's kind of a, this interesting topic that keeps coming up from time to time. And this is where people are installing Qvert with this additional tooling to spin up Kubernetes clusters with in Kubernetes clusters where the nodes are Kubernetes virtual machines themselves. And again, for use cases like that, it's our modular design that's, that's making all this kind of possible. All right, so I wanna quickly define what I mean by an opinionated install. So it, an opinionated install uh, of Qvert at least is when we take the Qvert core, uh, the any sort of additional add-on components and the configuration data that kind of binds all these components together, that's what we're calling an opinionated uh, install. Um, so with an opinionated install, we're enabling a specific set of features and workflows in Keeper to target a specific set of use cases. And going back to our previous examples, if I had an install um, with Keeper plus Maltus and SRV device plugin and all the stuff that I've highlighted here in, in red, uh, that would be an opinionated way of configuring Qvert that's optimized for use cases where hardware GPUs and network devices are needed. So that's an opinionated install. Now, in order to kind of tee up Petter's conversation about uh, fast packet processing, I want to talk about one specific opinionated install aimed at supporting traditional virtual machine use cases that we're familiar coming from like um, VMware or Overt or, or maybe even OpenStack. And just real quick, one disclaimer so nobody's confused. This opinion install, it's how one company, in this case Red Hat, has envisioned coupling Qvert and various other open source projects together. But I want to be clear in saying that Qvert is completely independent from this install project. And the opinionated install project itself, it's open sourced and it, it, we, we can see a community form around this as well. Um, so consider this a, uh, a real world case study for how Qvert can be bundled and deployed with lots of other components to solve specific use cases. So um, when Red Hat began to look at how to leverage Qvert, their goal was to provide a migration path from other um, virtual machine management platforms onto Kubernetes. This meant you know, one cluster for both legacy virtual machines and containers to run side by side. It also meant support for the kinds of features and performance characteristics that people are familiar with from the legacy virtual machine management platforms. So basically, uh, they wanted to be able to lift virtual machines from legacy platforms onto Kubernetes and provide feature parity there. In order to accomplish this, an opinionated install was designed that involves coupling Qvert with around uh, seven or so additional components, uh, as well as the configuration that kind of binds all these components together. And during the process of designing all this, we quickly discovered that just the sheer complexity of installing, configuring, and updating, and all these individual components and the configuration, it was just unwieldy. Um, so what we wanted was a way to coordinate the install and updating of this entire collection of components and configuration all as a, sing um, as a single cohesive unit. And that's where we came up with this idea of something called the hyperconverged operator, or we call it the HCO for short. Um, we've had difficulty, especially in the beginning, trying to describe what the HCO is to people because we don't have, um, we don't have a great language or a set of terms to describe exactly what we're doing yet. So we, we've kind of invented some to help us. And the best we've, we've been able to do is call the HCO an operator of operators or a, um, a meta operator. And the concept here is we have an operator, top level operator, the HCO, that's in co coordinating the install and updates of a collection of subcomponent operators as a single unit. So this means the HCO is responsible for coordinating the install and updates of all these subcomponent operators like Qvert, CDI, and others that make up this opinionated Qvert install. 
And just to kind of make sense of this, um, I'm going to briefly go through um, kind of the, the flow of how this is installed. Um, so it kind of goes into the HCO architecture, but I'll, I'll touch on this briefly. Um, the HCO deployment manifest, it's a collection of the HCO operator deployment plus every subcomponent operator deployment. So this means that the HCO and subcomponent operators are all, they're all installed and updated in lockstep with one another. So once the HCO and subcomponent operators come online, the HCO coordinates installing all the subcomponents by posting custom resources for each subcomponent operator that are crafted in a specific way to enable the kind of functionality uh, that we need exactly the way we need to, to support our use cases. So the HCO <clears throat> is managing the configuration data uh, as, as custom resources that kind of bind all these subcomponents together. And then the subcomponent operators themselves then react to this configuration data by installing their respective components using uh, the config provided by the custom resources. So from this diagram, if we follow one of these logical flows, uh, we can see the HCO is posting the vert CR or the, the vert custom resource, which is telling vert operator how to install kubevert. And this pattern is replicated for all our subcomponent operators. I only listed three in this diagram due to space, um, but here's the full list, I believe, as it is today. And I'm not gonna, I don't think it's pertinent for me to get into every single one of these. I'll just point out that the cluster network add ons operator. That subcomponent uh, is the one that's in, uh, in charge of installing things like Maltus and Cubemat pool. And some of the C9 plugins our PNA at install uses. And Pedro's going to go in more details with that because it, it, it's leveraged um, to, to support fast packet processing. All right, one last thing, just because I think it's neat. Uh, the HCO, it can be installed from something called um, an Operator Lifecycle Manager uh, Marketplace, so an OLM Marketplace. It can be completely managed using something called an OLM subscription. So a user uh, can go to this OLM Marketplace, they can enable the HCO operator, and that results in a specific version of the HCO to be installed. So it's essentially that um, the HCO manifest that I was talking about earlier, the OLM posts that HO, uh, HCO manifest, uh, which installs everything. Um, and then updates can be managed automatically by the OLM. Uh, so if a new update of the HCO comes in, uh, this results in the OLM rolling out new manifests, which update all the subcomponents and all this um, is logically managed. It's just a single unit for the advent. So this, this subscription, which uh, is kind of neat. So it means we can manage the HCO updates and all of this. Uh, all this complexity is hidden by a subscription with live updates at this point with the OLM. Um, so it's kind of like um, receiving an update for your phone. It just kind of happens. Uh, that's both, <laughs> it's both powerful and depending on your perspective, uh, it might be a little bit scary as well, but it's interesting at least. Um, okay, so that's my brief intro into Qvert and the Pinade installs. Just kind of summarizing here, the takeaway from all this is to understand that Qvert performance doesn't happen automatically. Uh, this is something that has to be configured and tuned, and it's our job as Qvert, and even Kubernetes developers, <clears throat> um, to provide ways to enable these sorts of tunings so people can uh, build these sorts of opinion opinionated installs I've been talking about. Okay, so I want to hand off the rest of this presentation to Petter, and he's going to talk about um, network performance and uh, we're gonna we're gonna try a proxy where I go through the slides and uh, he talks so there might be a little bit of back and forth here but we'll get through it um, thanks thanks you ready Petter yes and kudos for the stick figure art you had on the previous slide it was really pretty thanks I worked really hard on that so I would like to uh, dive a little deeper into the network add-ons uh, part here, the CNA operator, and for short, let's call it CNOW. On this picture, it shows only Multus as uh, one of the deployed components, but if we look at the full list, um, it has way more, uh, way more components included. So there is Multus that allows you to con connect your container or VM to uh, multiple networks, CNI networks at the same time. 
We also ship Bridge CNI that allows you to connect your container to a Linux bridge configured on the host. And that way you can get access to an L2 network. We have also very similar, similar CNI plugin for Open vSwitch that does pretty much the same with different implementation of Bridge. Then there is uh, Cube Mac Pool, which is a uh, Mac pooling manager. Uh, what it gives you is that it makes sure that um, the MAC address that's assigned to your container or a VM on the secondary network that may be connected to L2 broadcast domain. Um, it has a unique MAC address and it's not repeated anywhere else in the cluster and that way you don't have any collision. We also ship a component that's called NM state. Now, I will talk uh, more about it in the next slides, but what this gives you is the capability to configure host networking through Kubernetes API. So if you want to configure VLANs or bridges or whatever you want on hosts, you don't need to SSH. You just specify YAML, apply it, and that's it for you. Um, and all of these components are shipped and enabled by default in HCO uh, deployments. But if you use uh, cluster network add-ons operator, see now standalone, you can opt in any subset of these uh, yeah, that you want. And finally, there is also the SRLV operator. It's not integrated into the network add-ons operator uh, as of now. Uh, it may change in the future, but it's still worth mentioning because we'll get to that point at the end of the presentation. Um, in short, it's an, another operator that is standalone for Kubernetes, and it allows you to con configure uh, SRLV uh, network interfaces on your hosts and leverage them for your um, containers or virtual machines. Now, uh, the title of the presentation promised fast uh, packet processing, but I would like to start with a slow one or just a regular one. So, and uh, just to default basic Kubernetes deployment, the whole networking that you get is the default uh, CNI network. It's not part of Kubernetes, it's third party resource. Anyway, uh, all you get by default in vanilla deployment is just uh, one big network that connects all the hosts and all the containers that are running there. It's often based on an overlay network, but not always. Um, and with this uh, mechanism, we connect our container or our pod uh, to this network. And then in this pod, we create the VM. We do this very specific binding mechanism to extend the container or the pod network to the VM. And uh, that's the whole process. Due to the use of overlay or due to the fact that all the endpoints are connected to this network, it may be quite slow. Uh, but on the other hand, it's really well integrated into the whole Kubernetes network infrastructure. So you can use network policies, you can uh, use services, all this stuff is uh, just working. Now, uh, to show you uh, how this may look like. So in this picture, we have three nodes, they are connected. They each, each, every one of them has a single NIC connected to one big network and they form an overlay. And so, you know, they can communicate with each other and we connect our VMs or containers to this huge overlay. And by doing that, we become able to communicate from one end to the other. I, I mean, this is basically just a default Kubernetes networking with containers or VMs. Now, I mentioned the binding of the VM to the container network. Um, so with Kubert, we, we run the VM inside the pod, inside the container in the pod. And by doing that, we are isolated from the outside and everything we get is really just what a regular process would get in, uh, in the pod. So we some need to somehow connect our VM to the network. How do we do it? We have our pod that uh, has a um, single NIC, single network interface connected to the overlay or to the primary network of the cluster. Um, in this pod, uh, we create a container 
And in this container, there is a process running, which in our case happens to be a virtual machine. And you know, in this virtual machine, uh, we configure an, another network interface, ETH0 in this case. And now the question is, how do we connect this ETH0 with the one that's in the pod and to you know, connect these two networks? Um, the default mechanism uh, we choose uh, is a one-to-one -one, uh, network address translation where we connect the VM to a Linux bridge configured in the pod. Um, then we create, we start a DHCP server in the pod that offers uh, a IP address. It doesn't really matter what IP address it is, but it offers it through the bridge to the virtual machine. So when the virtual machine starts, it obtains this IP address. At this point, the virtual machine is not connected to the outside network. We connect it uh, by using an IP tables or, uh, any, or NF tables, where we say that if uh, traffic comes into the pod and it's designated to a certain port, we will forward it to the virtual machine. Now, this, is, uh, this may seem a little clunky. Uh, the main motivation to go this way is that we really treat the virtual machine as a standalone process inside the container and the binding to the container network does not really change the state of the pod network. Uh, so it should be pretty universal and we shouldn't be broken by different implementations of CNIs. Um, but you know, IP tables, total bridges, this may be quite slow. How it looks from the API perspective, uh, this is a truncated example of virtual machine instance definition. On the right side, you see that in the spec, there is a list of networks. We only want an pod network. Uh, we name it default. And in the devices uh, list, uh, in the interfaces list on the bottom, we say that we want to mount this default network through a masquerade binding. And I think this will make more sense once we introduce uh, different binding mechanisms and multiple networks. But this is how would you explicitly configure attachment to a network. If you completely omit the both section, you just get access to the default network. So this is uh, not a must have. Now, not yet the real fast networking, but for a faster packet processing, um, there is, uh, I will, I pick this as an example, which is quite typical for the legacy workloads. Uh, where you connect the VM to uh, some bridge on the host, and that gets by doing that you get an L2 connection to the VM. So how do we do it? We configure a bridge on the host. We connect the bridge to one of the network interfaces of the host to get access to the outside network. Uh, then we plug or we connect a container or a pod to this bridge from the other side. Uh, by doing that, we extend the L2 network from the outside uh, through the host to the container. And in the last step, we, uh, we attach the VM to this uh, interface in the, uh, in the container. I will show you a picture and it will be uh, easier to understand it from there. Um, this may be faster than the regular networking thanks to the uh, layer two access to the outside network. It also allows you to use Pixie and anything that really requires auto networking and you're fully in control of the configuration of the network. Um, the drawback may be that it's not fully integrated into Kubernetes networking. So if you want to get services running or network policies, you may need to do some heavy lifting yourself. Uh, so, you know, it, the, the use case of this is just to get an additional network for to, fulfill some special, specific use case. Um, so again, there is a cluster with three nodes, but this time we also have a switch for uh, two of those that is an additional mix connected to the switch on two of these hosts. Now we configure a bridge on, on these hosts uh, to be able to extend the L2 uh, network and we create a VM, which has one NIC connected to the regular network for, let's say, management, and an additional NIC that's connected uh, through the bridge to the switch. And uh, the same 
uh, VM would be on the other host. So they can communicate with each other oh, either, either through the regular network or through the fast L2 network uh, that can be as isolated or whatnot, whatever you want. It should be faster, yeah. Um, uh, quickly about multos. So in, in Kubernetes, the assumption is that uh, there is a third party plugin uh, of your choice and Kubelet communicates with it using CNI and uh, the plugin is responsible to connect all the hosts and the containers together so they can access one another just using an IP address. Um, by default in Kubernetes, there is a single CNI, so you can have only a single network and you cannot choose too much. But fortunately there is a couple of uh, so-called meta plugins that uh, work around this limitation. One of them is Multus. So if you install Multus on the cluster, it basically replaces the default network, which uh, in the previous slide was Calico. And when Kubelet calls Multus and asks it, please uh, attach my pod to the network, uh, it would first uh, invoke the, the default networking. It was there before, Calico in this case. And then based on the configuration of the pod, it may call the Linux bridge CNI I mentioned or any additional uh, CNI. You can configure your VM or pod to any amount of networks you wish. Now, how does the binding uh, look in this case? So on this picture, you see we have the default network connected to the virtual machine and that's done using the masquerade binding uh, with IP tables. Now, if I have additional NIC on the host and I created the bridge on the host and I connected my pod to the bridge using Linux bridge CNI, how do I get the, the connectivity all the way to the VM? and to its additional NIC. So all we do is that we create a bridge, which, you know, it's a really primitive switch, basically. We connect both ETH1 on the, on the pod and on the virtual machine together, and that extends the L2 domain all the way from the right cloud to the virtual machine ETH1. Uh, there, is, there are still some bridges, uh, so, you know, needs to do additional hops in the processor, but it's L2, so it should be pretty swift. Um, so how would you configure such a thing? Here, it's slightly more complicated than in the previous example with the regular network. This YAML shows you a node network configuration policy, NLCP in short. Um, this drives the NM state component I talked about in the beginning, and it tells it uh, what should be the desired state of networking on the host. And in this case, we want to configure a bridge. So on the right side, you see that we create an interface or we desire an interface of type uh, Linux bridge called bridge one. Uh, it should be up, it should obtain an IP address from the CP server, and it should be connected to the host uh, interface ETH0. So by applying this, you get this uh, bridge on the host and therefore you are able to attach containers to it or VMs. So in this uh, second YAML, what you see is a network attachment definition, which is an, uh, a type defined by the network planting working group. It's, it's a de facto standard and if you, just install Multus, uh, then you use these objects to define additional network networks. So in this case, we defined uh, something called blue network. Um, and in the spec, you see that it tells CNI uh, to connect to bridge one, take the traffic with uh, VLAN ID 100, and the type of the binding should be uh, bridge. And finally, on the virtual machine uh, definition, you uh, list on the networks list, you say, I want a blue network. And in the list of interfaces, you say, I want this blue network uh, to be connected to the VM uh, via the bridge binding. It gives you the extended L2 network, which wasn't the case with Masquerade. Now, finally, to the last part, how to do really fast packet processing. So, 
For this, we will use SROV uh, network interfaces that are configured on the hosts. They are exposed as a resource of the host, which I will uh, talk in detail in a minute. Uh, we, there, these SROV interfaces are somehow plugged into the pod or container, and then finally bind, bound into the VM. Um, the main benefit here is that this is as fast as it can get, to my knowledge at least. Uh, the drawback may be that it requires uh, special hardware, so you cannot test it on your laptop or on an uh, old server. But if you have a NIC that supports SROV uh, and you want fast networking, this is the way to go. So why SROV? Um, well, there would be an alternative to this, and that's that you would just connect a bunch of uh, network interfaces into the server in your rack and then plugged uh, every one of those into a switch. So you have 60 cables running out of the server and it's just a crazy idea. So some people came up with an idea that they would inter interpret a single uh, network interface that are, is plugged into the server uh, as multiple network interfaces inside the, the host. So typically you would get an SRO VNIC uh, you would configure it inside the host, and then you see that you have multiple uh, interfaces. Every one of those has uh, a dedicated MAC address. You can configure any IP address you want on it. And the great thing is they are, although they are all isolated, uh, well, that's the benefit actually. They are all isolated and uh, part of the network processing is done on the hardware and it's dedicated for every single one of those. Um, and these interfaces, they can be split into uh, two groups, basically. One of them is a physical function, which is the main one that represents the interface. You can do more configuration on it and it usually resides inside the host and it stays there. And then there are virtual functions. Uh, typically there is a lot of them, there can be uh, 64 of them um, or more probably and they have a dedicated part of the packet processing is uh, for them is well they have a special place in the NIC that does packet processing for them um, so yes and as a result you can use all these 64 interfaces for 64 containers or VMs and it should be as fast as the link speed. Now to illustrate it, uh, this is a host and the green, uh, green part is the network interface. The dark green part is the plug that goes to the outside and the purple one is the interface inside. Now, let's say I created two VMs on the host. Um, if I want to connect them to the NIC in the previous way I described, you would get, create a bridge on the host and then through other, other bridges, you would extend this to the VM. And this is not terribly fast because of the, uh, those bridges that are, you know, the traffic that flows through them is uh, pushed through the processor, through the kernel space, and it, it, is, it can be faster, let's say. So how does it look with the SRV? You have the NEC, but this, this time with the SRV cap capability, there is the physical function and a couple of virtual functions. Now, if you want to plug those VMs to the external network, all you do is you mount the virtual function to the VM, that's it. Uh, it's basically as if it was, uh, as if it was connected to the physical function, as if it was the host. It's really fast, there is no middleman. Uh, it's plugged directly to the outside network. And as, uh, one of my friends would say, this is like blazing fast networking. Uh, it, it can go as fast as the uh, link speed, basically. Now, how would you uh, get your hands of like such a setup that supports the SROV if you have the SROV Linux? So first of all, you would install SROV operator. Uh, you, can, you can live without it, but it does a lot of the heavy lifting. So uh, it would, rip the whole interaction with it happens through Kubernetes API. It reports all available network interfaces with their SRV capabilities through the Kubernetes API. 
uh, if you just say, I want to select this uh, Intel or this Mellanox next and configure SRIOV on them, it would do that for you. Um, and it also deploys all the additional components, device plug plugin and the CNI, um, like on top of that. So you will get the whole page package just by installing a single component. So first about the device plugin. Um, what the device plugin in general does, uh, it's uh, a concept in Kubernetes uh, where you have a gRPC service running on hosts. Uh, this gRPC service is co in cooperating with Kubelet. It handles discovery of uh, devices available on the host it, that advertises them on Kubernetes API as like a resource of the node. You know, when you can see how many CPUs you have, how much memory, and how many SROV virtual functions you can get. And when there is a user that wants to use one of these functions, it would allocate for uh, allocate it for them. Uh, then the other uh, piece would be a CNI. It uh, complements the device plugin in a way that device plugins, the device plugin tells CNI which a virtual function should be used, and the CNI plugs it into the uh, into the container. It configures MAC address, uh, IP addressing, uh, VLAN ID, all this. Um, yeah, that's that. So how it would look like again on these three nodes. So this time the ETH1 and the NEX are well, slightly bigger. They need to accommodate the SRIOV. So first of all, the, the operator would deploy configuration daemons on all the hosts. Now the configuration daemon would see that there is ETH1. So it would report it as a, uh, as SRIOV node network status or uh, something like that on the Kubernetes API, telling you, okay, I, on these hosts, I have these interfaces available. Do you want to use them for uh, Kubernetes? And if you uh, say, yes, I want to use these, it would uh, configure the interface. It would enable the virtual functions there, uh, load all, all the kernel modules. All this would be done by this daemon. And then, uh, operator schedules the device plugin uh, on the node. The device plugin sees, okay, there is an SRO VNIC and it has uh, three uh, virtual functions. I will expose it as an avail available resource uh, on the node. So that's what it does. And the same would happen on the other nodes. So, you know, now we have two nodes that are capable of uh, providing this fast network. So how would the scheduling look like then once we have everything configured and exposed? Um, let's say on one of the hosts, it's already fully occupied. There are three pods using these virtual functions. And I create a new pod or a VM that says, I want the fast network that was previously defined. So what the Kubernetes schedule would do, it would kick out the first node because it doesn't have the resource. The third one, because uh, all the resources are occupied and then it would finally schedule the VM and it's brought to the, the, to the empty node. And then all, the whole machinery of plugging of the VM uh, happens. So how it works like, uh, when, when we schedule the pod or the VM on the host, the device plugin uh, would be asked to um, to take the virtual function from the, from the host and mount it through Kubelet to the VM. So, or to, sorry, to the pod. And that's what it does. Uh, then uh, Multus or CNI kicks in, it configures the MAC address and uh, the VLAN ID, all this. Um, and then you have um, the SRLV network available in the container. Now, there are some differences uh, depending whether you want to use this for containers or for virtual machines, but I will talk about only about the VM part. So again, there is a report. It's already connected to the default network for management. Or, and the virtual function is still on the host on its neck. So the device plugin in conversion with CNI plugs it into the pod. And then all we have to do, we 
Tallulivert, which, uh, uh, which controls the virtual machine in Kubert, to take this virtual function and plug it as a pass to, uh, to the VM. And that's what it does. And now we are connected to the outside network through L2, through SROV, and we are hopefully getting some fast performance running. Really fast. Now, there is some tweaking involved because if you just uh, do what I previously described, it's, it doesn't necessarily mean that you get the fastest performance you can get. So for SROV, it's really important to align all the hardware as close together as you can on the same NUMA trees. Fortunately, the, the device plugin already reports that, okay, this VF flies on this NUMA uh, to the Kubernetes scheduler. Uh, and since Kubernetes 118, I think that the, the topology manager is uh, enabled by default. And what it does, it tries to align all the CPU and memory and all the other devices as closely together as it can. So, you know, closer it gets, the faster they are. Um, and Kubert leverage is part of that. Uh, it allows you to uh, pin your VM to a specific CPU and all this, but I won't go into detail here. We are quite short on time. And the last, the, the pinnacle, the last step of how to get really fast networking. This is not really related to Kubernetes or, uh, or Kubert specifically, but some of the networking applications like uh, virtual network functions that are running in VMs use DPDK, which is data plane development kit, I believe. And what this is, is that it replaces the networking that happens in the kernel with networking that happens in the user space, uh, which allows you to do some further optimization and get, uh, get better performance, basically. Um, one requirement of DPDK is that it has huge pages on the guest that, uh, if you don't know which, which pages are, typically you have the, sectors of the memory split into like a couple of kilobytes. With each pages, it can be all the way to one gigabyte. Um, and if you have such a big, and these huge chunks of memory are used for DPDK. Um, the good thing is that Kubernetes with collaboration with uh, Kubert can give you these huge chunks of memory inside the guest and then allow these uh, advanced networking use cases. So to give you an example, uh, real quick, uh, first we again configure the host networking. This, uh, this time it's not using NM state, but the SRV operator. So I create an SRV network node policy that says, uh, if you find the, uh, a NIC that has device ID 1017, I believe that should be in Mellanox, uh, then expose it as a resource called fast network. Uh, if you apply this, it, as I said, operator would go to the host, it would configure the next and expose the resource. Uh, then you, for uh, the, you, so that was from the admin part. And now the admin would continue and they would create an SRV network, which is something that would be available for users. Uh, in this case, it's called fast network 10. And the 10 is there because if, this network exposes access to the fast network, but it would take all the traffic with VLAN ID 10. And then finally, again, there is this virtual machine. It's more complicated than one for Linux bridge, but on the uh, bottom right, you see that it requests this network we talked about uh, and all the rest, those are like pulls and triggers and bells and whistles to get the, the performance just right and as fast as it can get. Uh, if you wonder about details, um, hit us up in the uh, Kubernetes virtualization Slack. I don't think we can go into detail here. Uh, but yeah, this is a really fast virtual machine if you have SRV. So to wrap up, um, David talked about the HCO architecture and why is it important to get all the components right. They, you know, they, there is in HCO, there is a lots and there are lots and lots 
components that are communicating together through some APIs and they are complementing one another. You can use them all alone. Uh, like all the components uh, for networking I talked about are useful for pods alone, but we use them for in combination with virtual machines. Um, so if you pick this configuration carefully or let somebody else uh, do it for you, then you can get really fast performance. Um, and yeah, I talked about the difference, different ways to connect your VM to the network, the regular one, the L2 networking through a bridge, and finally the one with the SRV all the way to DPDK and all that. Um, and I, yeah, that, that's it. Um, thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, um, this is the time. I'm opening the Q&A. Oh, awesome. Thank you, David Patra. Uh, this is a, that was an amazing presentation. I learned a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, we have times for some questions. And uh, uh, if you anyone, uh, if you wanna, wanna, anyone want to ask something, please drop your message on the bottom of the screen. There is a QA box. Uh, our friend Fabian answered two questions, but we have more two questions here. One is, does the existing network metrics cover any CNI plugin, for example? And it's a very big uh, question. Uh, and the and disk metrics to NCDI plugin as well. I couldn't find any metric for the GPU plugin. I didn't. I didn't even know it was possible to do that. Actually, should Kubervert be responsible to expose metric for that plugin when enabled, or there is better ways to do that? All right. Sure. Okay. Let me answer that. So. Uh, so first, I will answer the last part. Uh, Kubert should not be responsible of reporting metrics of CNI. The, the beauty of this is that Kubert is able to communicate with CNI plugins through the CNI API, but it doesn't really implement them. So this would be something that's handled by a dedicated component. Uh, I'm not sure about the GPU or CDI, but for CNI, uh, I know there is ongoing work how to expose some additional metrics for uh, multiples and secondary networks. Um, if you ping me in the Kubernetes virtualization Slack, I can send you a link. I can't, I don't remember the name of it from top of my head. Hope it answers the question. Thank you. Uh, the other one is, has Kubevert been used with a Mellanox Sonic device? Um, I'm not sure about Sonic, but uh, we do test uh, Kubert with uh, Mellanox CX4 and 5 uh, on our uh, CI, if you want to check it. So for Mellanox CX4 and 5, we do testing. Uh, honestly, I don't know what this Sonic is. Sorry. Okay. Uh, this may be a new buy question. What is the use case for VM in a container? David, to give you some space, do you want to answer this one? <laughs> okay, <laughs> sure. Um, well, there's a lot of use cases. Um, I, I'll just speak to the most obvious one uh, first, and that's uh, being able to do infrastructure convergence. So it's the ability to uh, run container workloads and your traditional virtual machine workloads together on a single cluster. Uh, but then again, as we've explored this, um, this capability more, we're seeing other use cases emerge as well. But uh, I think that the motivation initially was to be able to do infrastructure convergence. Uh, amazing. Uh, we don't have more questions now. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, Daily Petra, for the great presentation. It was amazing. Uh, that was, uh, thanks for joining us, everyone, today. The webinar recording and uh, slides will be online later today. 
We are looking. Oh, uh, looking for our. Oh, just looking for our. Just a little, I will start. We have a more question. Just one more one. More one. Uh, since in the sense migrate existing VM infrastructure over the Kubernetes. Well, certainly, if you're interested in simplifying your operation, I think that can make sense. Um, I, I think you have to look at uh, what your existing virtual machine infrastructure is, what features you use, and things like that, and ensure that you're going to uh, get feature parity um, as it is today using something like KubeVirt. And, and that's what um, we're working on. We're pretty close to a lot of these traditional virtual machine management platforms having feature parity there. Um, but that, those are the details you'd want to look at there, just ensuring that um, everything's there that meets your needs. And if it's not there, we're, we're very interested in understanding these gaps where they exist for people and understanding people's use cases further so we can kind of fill in these gaps in a way that makes the most sense in kind of the Kubernetes ecosystem because um, that, that's been kind of the challenge, matching these uh, existing virtual machine management platforms onto uh, work those were traditionally uh, imperative workflows and the Kubernetes is declarative. So we have to we have to kind of think about how we bring these things over. But yeah, I, I think it does make sense, certainly if you're wanting to do uh, infrastructure convergence and it's kind of simplify your operation. Uh, just as our, our objective here is sharing knowledge, I will uh, think, uh, say to Adam, D Dustin, thank you, Adam. Said to us, Sonic is a routing software that runs on the white box switches developed by Microsoft. Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, okay, we don't have more time. We don't have more questions. Uh, so, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, our webinar record and slides will be available later today. And we are looking forward to see you in the future CNSF webinar. Have a great day. Thank you everyone. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.